I think Bruce would will be here. No, he's he's emailed today. Okay. Just gonna shut the door. So we're just missing Bruce and Karen. And Greta. Uh, Greta's in uh, Belgium. No, okay. So she's not gonna be here. Well, welcome to this hearing of the Historic District Commission. Uh, the LTC acts under the authority of the Amherst Local Historic District Bylaw. Uh, and our purpose, as you know, is to aid property owners in the town of Amherst in the preservation and protection of the distinctive characteristics and architecture of buildings and places significant in the history of our town. Um, today's hearing is, we're not considering any special properties, but um, we are gonna talk about the East Village LD, LHD. Uh, we're gonna talk about parking uh, during project hearings, and we're going to uh, talk about officers. So um, let's begin with a consideration of the East Village LHD. Um, Steve. Well, Steve, you had a, there he is. you had a thought. I know we weren't supposed to talk about it and we didn't, but you did say you had a thought and then you didn't say anything. <laughs> I had a thought. <laughs> I don't know what thought that was. <laughs> uh, um, I guess, should we make a motion to like, um, to proceed or not proceed with um, the East Amherst LHD? Is that, is that how it works, Nate? Yeah, I think if, you know, I think what the commission's done is had you know two site visits, and then we're kind of discussing if that area is worth pursuing as a local historic district. And if so, you know the the commission could vote itself the study committee, or we could recommend that the town appoint a new study committee. So I think that's kind of where we are. You know, is it you know is the area worth pursuing, and then who would be the study committee, and then um, and then just moving forward with that. I think part of the process or discussion could be, I think Bruce's term ends at the end of the month and then I'm not sure he'll continue. And so then, you know, the question is, you know, do we, we could start, but then we'd want to get an architect or try to find an architect also on the commission for the process. So, but. Bruce. Um, a point of all, I guess I should ask Nate. Nate, um, Am I automatically off at the end of the month or am I on until replaced? Uh, I think once upon a time, I remember, no, after three years, I, uh, I became concerned that we were meeting without my having been reappointed. And I wanted to make sure that, the, uh, that, that we were making decisions uh, with somebody who was empowered to do so, me meaning me, uh, and I seem to remember at the time, but I maybe that it, that that I I continued um, uh, for some months without actually formally being reappointed. So I'm prepared to keep on going until I'm replaced, um, unless of course. I am automatically uh, ineligible at the end of uh, whenever the term is. Right. Um, so Bruce and Steve, it looks like your terms would end at the end of this month. Has the town manager's office reached out to you to confirm whether you continue or or not? Um, yes. No. I well, first of all, I didn't. I was just. I just joined like in November, so I was right. like startled. But no, I've been in communication with Paul and Paul. Um, said that he was going to renominate me. I mean, whatever he needs to do, reappoint me. So, uh, is that the way it works? Yeah, I and mean, I think for Bruce, you too. I mean, I, I can reach out to the town manager's office and and confirm that they will ask you. Um, and it could be that you get reappointed, and then you know, if at the same time as you're sitting, we can then try to reach out to, you know, to find architects if you know if you find that. You know, you wouldn't want to continue, say, on for another six months or a year or whatever it be. But um, typically, I thought the I thought you know appointments would just you know re you know they would just right be kind of reoccur, and then um, unless you said otherwise, you would just be reappointed through a kind of a perfunctory process. But I don't I should confirm that. 
If you would, yes, please. Liz, Elizabeth. Yeah, the question I had uh, was about the study committee. I'm assuming it would be some members from this group, but also do you appoint uh, members of the public? Or do you invite participation from others? Um, yes and no. I mean, they uh, typically the, the guidelines would ask for a similar composition to this commission. So, you know, an architect, realtor, someone with the historical society or, um, and then residents. And so it's really the, it's really up to the commission now, if you'd like to undertake that, that process. So, you know, some of it would be determining the boundaries, making sure all the properties are inventoried. We conduct a, a property owner survey, have a few meetings, write a report. I mean, I, I don't want to downplay the amount of work that could go into it, but, um, you know, there is a process, but, it, you know, I don't, the public's always welcome. It's a pub, they're public meeting. So even if this commission were to vote itself a study committee, we could, you know, as part of the agenda, it would be, you know, discussion of East Amherst and we would, it would be, you know, open to the public. So we could always invite people to come and attend. So the committee um, meetings are open to the public. Is that what you're saying? Not our committee, but the study committee. Right, even if you're right. Okay. Uh, Steve, um, a couple of things. First of all, I reviewed the handbook, and I think the next thing we have to do is gauge the property owner's interest. So can we send out the, I mean, I'm happy to type up the sample letter. And um, can we send it out to at least the national disc owners of the 46 properties? in the national uh, district, Nate? Yeah, I mean, I think first I'd want just a motion, you know, some discussion by this commission, if you if you would want to be the study committee, and if not, you know, then we have to go through the process of getting one appointed, and then roughly what are the boundaries? So first the commission or the study committee would do a little, you know, as we've been doing some field study and information gathering to determine what are the approximate boundaries and then notify property owners. So. I'm not sure we're act actually at that point yet to notify property owners. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. That, you are, right, so. Um, so I looked at the form Bs and there, there's like nothing on the form Bs. Um, I can type up stuff on the national register and start doing uh, template form Bs. There seems like there's uh, property descriptions of like 10 or 12 properties. And uh, actually, the significant section's already been done. Um, the thing I was going to ask you is, when is the CPA uh, is it the deadline? Is that already for this calendar year? Is that come and gone? Yeah. So the funding that's available for July one has been, you know, was voted on, you know, over the winter. So the funding round for next year, you know, for funding next July would start actually probably in August. So in a few months. You know, they would ask for applications that would be due in September or, or something, but the money doesn't become available until the following July. So, oh, okay. Well, I was going to just wouldn't say Dorothy Pan suggested to me that uh, because there's going to be a lot of research required on this, um, and uh, she suggested that Heady Startup uh, we get a grant and try to get Heady Startup who's a train who does this stuff and uh, who's serving on the historical commission. So I'm wondering if we should, you know, plan on. I'm happy to fill out a CPA um, application in August to try to raise funding uh, to get her on board. If everyone's on, fine with that. Yeah. The only thing is, the work can't start that until next July. Well, next July. Yeah, we can't reimburse work start, you know, doing mm -hmm. done this fall uh, or over the winter. Are there any other uh, places we could get grants from for this kind of work? Uh, MHC does a planning and survey grant, which is due, I think, usually in the spring, winter, spring. Um, I'm not sure of many others, actually. Kind of, yeah. Bruce, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes, I think it's probably appropriate that we uh, create a motion that makes this conversation um, worth having. Uh, I mean, we're having a discussion on the on, on a motion that hasn't yet been proposed. So there seems to be a, uh, uh, so I, I thought, Nato and Steve, we could help uh, 
so, so I think I'm moving that this uh, that the commission uh, recommend the appointment of a study committee. Is that the 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 the, the to uh, investigate the uh, uh, um, study committee to move forward with the uh, um, the uh, consideration of establishing the uh, um, a, a, a local historic district in north in East Amherst. And I guess when we were walking around, we were thinking that it would be um, well, let's say uh, as defined in red. Um, and I don't know how to how to uh, put in words that that uh, that limit. But I'll, I'll start the motion by proposing that it's that it be defined by the area uh, def uh, that it be the area defined in red on the uh, on 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 our our plan that we were using. So that that so that wording needs to be refined so that it actually means something. But basically, move that. I guess Nate, we're we're uh, uh, moving that this commission is moving to appoint a study committee. Is that the uh, correct wording? Yeah, that the commission would act as the study committee. Yep. Okay. Well, we would appoint that study committee, and uh, and it's to consider creating the, an historic uh, district in East Amherst. Correct. And as defined by, and then I just need the words that define the the area in red. And then we've got a motion, and then we can talk about it. Because I think we need to talk about whether we want it to be the red area or the blue area. I mean, you know, red, he, red or red and blue, right? Steve, yeah, on that point, I'd like to, Nate, can you go, I found a great, I know Elizabeth was frustrated because we didn't have a good map, and I found a great map which I think uh, we could refer to in, in Bruce's motion. Can you pull up page 19 of the, um, of the uh, National Registry, the National Registry, not the extension, but the actual original one? Can you, is that possible for you to do? Yeah, I was actually gonna do. The map that looks like this. I can't, it literally has all 46 properties delineated and uh, labeled. And the boundaries are clear. It's really easy to read. It's much easier than the map that Bruce is referring to. Page 19 of um, not that. Yeah, so one here's right. here's yeah. the the macros maps, and what Bruce is referring to is this red here. That's now orange. So it's yeah, I can zoom in, but oh, you know here's the here's the East Amherst School right here. Here's Main Street. Here's Southeast Street. Here's the Ithmar Conkey house over here. You, you can't find. Oh. And is is the uh, is the farm up in Northeast Street uh, included, or is, is it because it's a funny? Yeah, they included all the uh, you know in some of the outbuildings. So here's Hedrow Lane, and here's the farm. Okay, so there are two oranges here. Then we have to be well, clear. That we... You know, what happened was they only included when they did their national register district, they only went back this far. Yeah. The property, they didn't include all of it. And so. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a blue line separating. Uh, uh, there's a, the, there, are, there are two defined uh, areas in that right, we, map. There's that area there. And then below it, there's the, that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all one, um, you know, this, they, this property is also in another, you know, proposed to be in a, an ex, the expanded district. So that's why it's. Oh, it comes up twice. Right, yeah. Well, so uh, Steve's trying to get the terminology. Yeah, no, I'm just saying, Nate, you, of the materials that you sent us, if you go to the one that's National Register of Historic Places Inventory, and you scroll down, there's like a fantastic map. Yeah, I don't have that ready right now. Oh, okay. I have the expansion one ready, but not the other one. Hmm. Well, if this okay. one that, that Nate pulled up is a is a is a is a, a definable. Uh, and oh, I see. Uh, M A C R I S maps. I actually... Yeah, Massachusetts something. Yeah, this is Macris. So this is the state inventory database. They put you know created an online mapping si system. So this yeah. is right here. This is the official map. 
Well, if you can if you can put in words the 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 descriptor the description of the orange area, then the motion can be completed. Yeah, I mean, I would say just the East Amherst National Register District. Okay, East Amherst National Register District. That's the motion. I second. Uh, okay, uh, so we'll do a, a voice vote. Um, well, Bruce? Hold, hold on. Uh, I propose the motion in order to focus the discussion on the motion, so I'm not sure we're ready to. Oh. I, 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 all of the conversation we were having was uh, kind of implying that there was an intention to proceed. And I thought we should formalize the intention to proceed. So we, we have formalized the intention, at least so far as the motion has been proposed and seconded. But we want to make sure, I think, that the motion is, uh, is, 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 is complete as it should be. And are we satisfied that the uh, blue area that we looked at or that we didn't look at, but we kind of thought about looking at, are we, are we satisfied that, that, that this study committee would, would not uh, be, uh, would not attend to uh, the, 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 the blue parts? I think when, oh, do I have to signal? Go ahead. Go ahead. Do I have to signal to my hand? Um, yeah. I think that um, when we were uh, taking a look at, we were out in the landscape taking a look at this, I think it became clear to us that the, uh, uh, she had emailed me saying there was spotty internet. So I think, you know, oh, yeah, she's, frozen. she seems to have frozen. Um, I, I wonder if she was going to say that we had decided that it might, a larger district was was going to be too much work for us to try to define and deal with, and that we should stick with what had already been done. Um, Nate, I sent you that map. Yeah, I actually just got it screenshotted myself and is available. Yeah, I, I'm inclined to agree, but uh, but I know less about this than some of you. Elizabeth, did you want to say something now? Yep, she's disappeared. You might phone in next. I, I thought she had maybe phoned in, but. Yeah, well, I'm sharing the screen right now. Here's the map. You know, this is the district that was shown in red, just in a different, on a different map. Oh, that's, yeah, that's quite good. And when I look at the actual, um, they have an explanation of why they chose those borders in their, uh, uh, you know, in, the inventory, which I think make a lot of sense. It says, I mean, should I wait for Elizabeth to get back on? Um, I mean, I guess we could always, we could wait a minute, but then we could always, she, you know, the links become available if she wanted to <laughs> yeah. watch it here and there. Yeah, no, what it says is the, um, the, the bounds of the East Village Historic District were drawn to include a concentration of residences and institutional buildings associated with the industrial village's heyday prior to the Civil War. Uh, and it basically did a long explanation, which I think is very cogent, which is why they chose these 46 properties, which include 12 intrusions. So we do have a rationale for it. Hmm. Okay. The uh... Uh, the 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 properties are the color the, the colored brown but are uh, inside the the district I'm on the top uh, or up on the left hand top side there they um, they they look like apartment blocks uh, in from uh, it, yeah, says, it does include twelve intrusions yes yeah. yeah yeah so those are included how they yeah, so they would be contributing. They're considered non-contributing. So the NC in red. Yeah. Which, if we zoom in, there's that's what Steve was talking about. There's a number of properties that are considered, you know, non-contributing. Okay. And the and the rationale for including them is.
I guess that's a question. I think it's to protect them from doing something else to the property. Oh. Like yeah. if they could pull it down and put something else there. Okay, so they're they're not contributing, but they we want them to stay non-contributing rather than to becoming negative contributors. There must there might be some sort of geographical. I mean, if you look at the bottom here, there's other NCs, and you can see why there are. I think it's just that area you're talking about, and it might be because of property. There's usually some explanation for it with either streets or or geographic you know features. Of, yeah, you should definitely try to find that out. So interesting. It looks like the school is a non-contributing, uh, considered a non-contributing building. Is that possible? Yes. Is that not because it's more? No, not not the not the Fort River the school. The, right here. The East oh. River. The, the this guy here. Yeah, they may have done that because there was a fire in the '30s and the roof was changed, and so the original, um, you know, what it looks like now is not related uh, to the period of significance that Steve. Referenced, okay. yeah. Um, you know, but... you know. I'm sorry. I should raise my hand each time. I think it's not. A, it's not contributing because it's of a different era. I mean, most all these other properties are from the late 1700s to like the 1850s, and I think the school was built in like the early 1900s. Yes. Yeah, didn't you specifically say that these were pre-Civil War? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know, sorry, just to jump in like quickly, you know, the um, when we're looking at this image, you know, further down with Main Street, you know, to uh, I don't know if it's like to your right, but down here where the cursor is, there's a few more properties to the, the Amethyst Brook, right? And so, you know, it could be that this is all this is a natural boundary or that we include a few more properties. And so that's the kind of the you know, to me, those are the discussion points. I feel like, you know, also going north a bit, is that a good logical break here? Or is it worth, you know, how much further do you go? It becomes slightly different character, right? It's, um, you know, agricultural, there's different, you know, and so, you know, this could be a starting point. I would, I still think there should be some discussion in the, um, in the preliminary study report that we'd submit to Mass Historic. We'd try to justify the boundaries and it could be that we rely on the National Register nomination, but that's pretty old. And we could say that we researched it again and we still think those boundaries are, you know, are legitimate because of these factors. And that's why we didn't expand them. So I do think there has to be some consideration for what, you know, you know, do we expand in any direction? And so. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we, we didn't uh, go looking uh, at the let's say uh, Salem Street, for example, um, uh, there are two uh, properties on the corner of Main Street. I kind of remember them. Um, I think one of them is that extraordinary building with the uh, this this uh, 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 six six ninety four is that extraordinary building that a uh, very lovely old building that's had a full dormer put on either side, which basically just raised the whole building through the roof. So that the roof has really been just a bunch of eaves at this point. So if we, but I, we didn't look at the buildings further up Salem Street and so forth. But I imagine that the people who set this up in the first place would have done that. But maybe we should make sure that there's that the the building, um, the buildings in the side streets are are not um, are, are not of equivalent date. Or has that already been done, do you think, Nate? If it was done and it wasn't documented in the nomination, then we'd have to just kind of, we'd have to do it again. You know, okay. there is, um, in well, the macros, a... I'm going to go back to the Macris map. So in the proposed uh, East Amherst expansion, which is now orange, you know, the PVPC did look at Salem's place, you know, the Salem Street and more of Spalding and some other ones down Main Street. So that mm. work has been done. So I think we just have to, you know, look at the expansion report and see if it's similar to the original nomination here. Yeah, I looked at, I have it right in front of me. And if we were to do that and find that all of, that the houses substantially in blue were 
post civil war that sounds like it would be a uh, I mean, it, we we could, of course, as we are thinking of doing in uh, in the Dickinson Lincoln area, uh, expanding the uh, the district. Um, I guess one can always just think to expand the district, um, uh, but I'm kind of inclined to tackle the uh, the, the 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 pre Civil War uh, concentration, which seems to be the orange. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then I guess the, the, the study committee would, uh, would, would confirm the relevance of the area and make sure there were no anomalies. And if there were, then we, they would come back and we would talk more about it. Right. right. Steve. Oh, I just have it. In, uh, first of all, Elizabeth's back, so if she can see that other map, that would. Um, I'm just looking at. I have the uh, the inventory of the extension uh, properties, and there are um, probably five or six that are pre Civil War. Uh, Pelham Road, 1850. A bunch on Pelham Road, 1830, 1840, 1847 on Pelham Road. Uh, Northeast Street, there's one in 1840, Spalding. But actually, the ones on, um, yeah, the other ones on Main Street are of a different era, uh, like 1890 and above, mm. or more current. Uh, Elizabeth? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, everybody. Um, I, th I told Nate that our, our building got hit by lightning and it's um, the internet's coming and going here. Um, is it possible for the committee, the commission, uh, the study commission to make that final determination? Uh, is, it seems like um, uh, there may be some things that are in blue that want to be considered for this, but not all of them. So could that committee make that determination after you know after careful thought? Yeah, I mean the motion, you know, could be amended to say you know starting with the current National Register District for East Amherst, yeah. and then it's you know, and then it's really right. The study committee could add a property or two, or you know, just make yeah small modifications if necessary. Yeah, because I think. Oh dear. Well, you may, it may not be uh, in the period of some of the others, but it forms a cohesive center for the 20th century. So maybe it could be included, maybe not. Right, I mean, the local historic district isn't necessarily trying to bring back the period of significance. So it could be too that later homes are modeled after, you know, earlier ones. So if they're the same architectural style, it may be mm -hmm. from a local historic district standpoint worth um, including those. Uh, Bruce? Um, so, yes, I would therefore modify my motion, and uh, Steve, if you agree, uh, as Nate uh, mentioned, which is triggered by what Elizabeth said, which is that the, the study, the, the uh, area bounded by the, by the, by the, the macros map or whatever, um, and, uh, and, and that the committee would uh, um, look at the adjacent areas in blue with a view to adding appropriate, uh, uh, recommending ad uh, expanding the area uh, with, with uh, and, and consider any, um, um, and consider the case for the expanding the area in, 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 in specifically. Uh, who's taking minutes? <laughs> is that you, Nate? Are you doing? You make yeah. Sense this is of what being I'm recorded, so we're you know. Yeah. Well, if you history. if if you could amend the 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 motion that gives the study commission uh, that, that charges the study committee to also look at the uh, the surrounding uh, um, district defined in blue uh, 
for uh, adding appropriately uh, adding adding appropriate properties and and explaining and making the case for doing so. Mm -hmm. You good with that, Steve? Oh yes, I am. Okay. Does anybody else have anything to say about this before we go move to a vote? Um, I, I guess I'm just wondering the timeline and the funding and things like that. Is that part of this discussion or that's like part of step two? I was thinking that was step two, but uh, Nate, yeah. what do you think? Well, you know, if, if the committee wants to move this forward now, you know, waiting for CPA funding or a grant from Mass Historic, you know, is basically we'd be sitting for another year. The, the, C, the CPA does have the capacity to release funds for specific uh, uh, short-term or emergency purposes. I seem to recall from my uh, time. Is, would this um, fit that category? No. Uh, well, it could, but I think they've already obligated all the funding available for FY twenty three and twenty four. So they really don't have any any funding. Uh, that would that could be allocated now. There might be some administrative funds. Um, we could look into that. I, I could look into that. But um, typically, they you know they allocate all the funding for each fiscal year and don't leave a, a reserve. So, hmm. so then we would uh, appoint the committee, uh, and that committee can start uh, on its own with its own resources and move as far as it can on its own resources um, at the same time as it's uh, putting together an application for the CPA or making the case to the CPA and, and, and waiting and, and then continuing to do, the, do whatever work it can. But I do recall that, uh, uh, sadly, the CPA is, is quite strident about not reimbursing. I wonder if there's a possibility of getting uh, student help from the university. Is that something that do we do we have contacts there that might consider that? Yeah, I mean, I think we'd have to, you know, we could reach out now to see if it could be a fall semester project. Um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, the town doesn't have any funding. So sometimes uh, the difficulty is we don't have funding to say have it be an internship or to fund, to be have it be a research project it would have to be something that would align with a class project yeah and it has to be directed someone has to tell them how to do it and sometimes that takes longer than doing it that's my experience Steve um well I mean what I was going to do I mean I've done this before what I did last time was I I have a I had everything on drop. I've already taken pictures of like 40 of the things and I put it on a Dropbox account. And last time we did this for Lincoln Sunset, we had a Dropbox account that everyone could access. Um, and then everyone could like work on different parts of the form B's. But because of open meeting law, I mean, it was so useful because um, we had three or four people working on form B's according to their expertise in the committee. But now, I would love to have that back because we could start doing it. I mean, I what I what I could do like starting tomorrow is I can look at the National Registry and this is what I did before and type it up on form B's and put the pictures up and you know it had like ten of the properties have very specific have very detailed physical descriptions which are great and there are some historical stuff in the natural natural registry and I would already type that up and then. Other people with certain, you know, expertise, like Elizabeth, for example, could go into the same forms and just fill out, you know, what they can add to it. But until we get a, a Dropbox or some sort of system where we can all access it, uh, we, you know, we can't do that. And in terms of students, I can uh, immediately contact Max. We had three, we had a number of student interns before, and I okay. can just email Max Page and. Um, you know, he'll recruit somebody. Um, there's no race on this, so but if, if we don't finish it in a year, that's like you know, that's fine too. So, uh, uh we just want to do it right. 
So Nate, do we have access to Dropbox through the town or do we need to set up a separate account for that? Yeah, no, I think the town clerk's office had recommended not using something like that because there, it could be a violation of open meeting law in terms of having uh, discussions or information that's not publicly available. So uh, I'll look into it. I mean, what I had done was with the East Amherst information, I put it through, you know, available on the town's website through the local historic district commission webpage. And so, you know, it could be something like that. Uh, it does become tricky when you have working documents, you know, how to post them and keep them from, um, you know, having it be something that looks like a conversation. So, you know, the last time that Ben Breger, you know, before me had asked for this commission, they had recommended not using Dropbox, but using, just putting it on the town's website or putting it somewhere where all the information is public. So that way, you know, there's no, there could be, you know, no risk of violating open meeting law. Is, is there an easy way to create uh, access to that town website? Because it seems a little complicated and disorganized at the moment. Um, yeah, we could set up, I'm just thinking. Um, yeah, we could, I, could, I, could, I think we could set up some folders and a directory uh, and we could probably organize documents a little better. But you know, the- Can you check with town council again about Dropbox? Because we're not like we're deliberating, we're just doing research and, and yeah. you can make it accessible to anyone who wants to look at it, though I doubt anyone will. Yes, and if it was simply a repository and it didn't have any documents in it that were being edited, if it was a, a place where we collected information and 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 put it in, uh, it, it, Nate, you could you could perhaps if if Steve was operating it, if we were operating as simply as a repository, um, I don't see how that. Well, that wouldn't violate the open meeting law, but I can see that some people might think that different people had a different idea of what the word repository meant and that that would be the risk. But if the uh, if if we would uh, all sign a, a, a document that that that, uh, that acknowledged that we understood, had a common understanding of what that word repository meant and that we would commit to using it as such and no more, then I think a lot of what Steve's trying to do could be achieved. Yeah, I'll ask. I was just going to try to go quickly through my email. I don't, I don't, I don't see anything, but yeah, I think, I mean, they had provided something in writing to Ben uh, recommending not to. So I, I guess it's just a matter of, you know, what, how, how do we, how can we manage it? Yes, I think for folks are just, it's, it's easier to say no, basically. And, uh, uh, and we want to get to yes, and getting to yes might take a bit of effort, but if we are committed to demonstrating an understanding, uh, hopefully, uh, and, and the purposes are, are clear, then uh, the, the blanket no, hopefully, uh, with um, can be uh, adjusted. Yeah, I think if it's just a repository and we're not having a conversation outside of these meetings about what's in that repository. I don't see how it can be considered a violation of the open meeting law. Well, just the, you know, I think the concern is right that there could be some communication there that isn't available to the public. Yeah, no, I mean, it, that never happened when we were doing it before. It would literally be like, I would do transcribing and then Marianne or, um, and, you know, somebody else would go on and put the history, you know, or Susanna Fabing would go on and do put, uh, cut and paste their research onto the same form. And then somebody else would do a physical description of the properties, which I'm not equipped to do because uh, I'm not an architect or a historian. And then, you know, together we would complete like, you know, we did 100 and we did 200, you know, you were there at eight. We did 200 properties that way. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll follow up with the clerk's office and just see. I'm I guess I was trying to find an email right now and I don't I'm not seeing it. Um, so, Elizabeth, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was guess I was just going to ask, how do you work on a joint 
project if you can't do that you know you, <laughs> how do you draft you something together i can type it up and uh, you know so, i don't know it just it seems yeah. like whether it's google drive or dropbox or something that it's not deliberation it's it's work and we're work and collaborating on one form that's all yeah yes. i mean i'm not i don't disagree i just think though that you know the say the state law regulations haven't caught up with the way technology is being used so i'm not you know typically we'd say email me your information i spend the time synthesizing and then i email it back out and it's just it becomes pretty laborious on uh, everyone's part so yes <laughs> well, and if, yeah, i'm sorry Bruce. is google drive also uh verboten well I, you know i, I so i think that, um, i can ask like what you know how to do this right so it, it, whether i think the concern is that whether it's Google or Dropbox, you need an account to access it. So it's not necessarily available to the public. Uh, that's all. Whereas if we posted it on the town's website through a folder directory, anyone can download it and access it. Um, you know, and anyway, so I'll, I can ask the clerk and I can try to get some clarification on that. Okay. Because last, cause last time it was fine. We didn't have any, this is a new thing. You people. Yeah, but you know, I think <laughs> some of it is the, since then, it's been a few years, I think the clerk has either a different interpretation or has received new information or guidance, say, from the state. So it's not, we can't rely on, you know, I agree, I thought last time it worked pretty well. Yeah. All right, well, I think uh, let's set that aside for the moment and talk about whether we would like to proceed with this motion to recommend that a study committee begin to consider the establishment of a local historic district in East Amherst. Uh, as defined by the Macris map. Um, I'm ready to vote. Is everybody, is everybody ready to vote? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, uh, Bruce. Aye. Nicole. Yes. Steve. Yes. Karen. Yes. Elizabeth. He's blocked, Richard. I think. Hmm. I think she's lost her connection again. Um, yeah. And and I'm in favor of it. Well, I think we have a majority in favor. And actually, uh, Greta had Nicholas. said uh, before the meeting that she would favor this basic idea. So I think we have a full majority in favor. Um, so the next step is to think about what we can do without uh, moving forward to do the full, uh, all of the research. But we, we need to don't we need to start by asking the property owners if they would support such a thing? Well, uh, point of order, don't, don't we need to appoint a committee? I, mean, I thought, I think, well, I think the, I thought the motion really was that this commission is acting as the study committee and is looking right. into it. Oh, uh, well, okay. Uh, that wasn't what I said, but uh, but that was because I understood that we had to appoint a committee. Oh, so maybe I, I miss on, you know, because you said we would study the the area around East Amherst and, you know, possible new properties, I guess, without defining who is doing that uh, work. Well, I, I thought the I thought we I thought the commission appointed the study committee. That's what I thought I heard uh, you or Steve State as being the process. But but if but if if the motion if everybody believed the motion said that the that the commission is the study committee, then that's fine by me. I uh, so is that is that is that what we? Uh, that that was my understanding, and that if we need additional help, which I think we probably will, we'll try yeah. to seek it out as we go. Okay. Um, Steve, are you good with that? Is that your understanding? Yeah, no, I mean I'm I looked this up today, and there's two different ways to do it. One is to like go before the town council and request the formation of the study committee. And that's, you know, when I did it before, um, I actually recruited everyone and I went to the town, to the select board with the study committee intact already, you know, with like the different elements, the architect, the member that has to be a member of the historical society. And I went there with a ready-made thing. But then when I looked at the handbook today, uh, we don't have, we, if there's already an existing local uh, historic district commission, which there was before, it, you know, we could just act as um, the committee. study committee if we want. It's, I mean, Nate has to clarify that. I'm not, 
quite sh um, sure. Yeah. Well, that we're, we're, as far as the motion that we voted on was your understanding that we were uh, that we that we the commission was the study committee. No, I just thought we were just deciding to pursue it. Uh, invest, you know, pursuing uh, not necessarily forming a study committee of ourselves. If we can do that, that certainly saves some time. But I just thought we were voting to like continue to pursue a study. Uh, you know. Um, uh, whatever, uh, local historic district in East Amherst. So, yeah, okay, yeah, no, right. So, yeah, Bruce's motion is really that it's worth pursuing the study of it, not, yeah, that's what I'm yeah, right. But if we can be the study committee, Nate, do we have to go through some sort of formal process or we just appoint ourselves a study committee? I think it would just be another motion and vote, and we'd relay that to the town manager. Uh, I don't, I don't see that right. The, the guidelines and the way the I read it too, is that if there's already an existing commission, unless you want otherwise, you you are the study, you know, you become the study committee. But I think it'd be good to have a vote and a, a motion and a vote and then a, you know, just correspondence with the town manager. Yeah, it's so moved that, that uh, we appoint ourselves the commission as the study committee. I second. Second. Uh, is there a discussion of this motion? Further discussion? Uh, okay, let's move to the vote then. Uh, Nicole? Sure. Uh, Steve? Yes. Bruce? Yes. Karin? Yes. And I'm in favor, uh, and we've lost Elizabeth. Uh, so what's next, Nate? What do we have to do next for that? Or, or do you want to move on to the next item on the agenda? Yeah, I mean, we could continue the discussion too about the boundaries or maybe next meeting, um, we could say for next meeting, you know, we have the information online, we could decide are there a few additional properties or, you know, even just if um, individually just drive down the streets to see if there's one or two properties that architecturally are similar. And then once we kind of have a, a basic uh, boundary, I think Steve's right, the next step would be to update, get all the inventory forms in the, in the current, uh, you know, template and then also notify property owners. So, you know, PVPC had done some work updating inventory forms, but not, not all of it. So it's gonna take, you know, essentially taking the template form and transcribing information into the new ones for every property with a new picture, a new map. Uh, and I ordered, and I already have a huge Dropbox file with a blank template and with 46 photographs and tons of like, you know, it's, it's all in a Dropbox account you know, ready for the, to go. It's just, how do I get it to everyone? Right, yeah, the, you know, some of the properties as Steve mentioned have uh, very little information about them. And so some of it would then be, once the, the forms have been updated, determining, you know, how many properties need to have a little bit more research done on them or have an architectural description on them. Um, you know, some just say, you know, it's like a one-liner. <laughs> And others might have a paragraph, so it's really inconsistent in terms of how much research was done on each property. Yeah, when I I, I think I went through like five of them on Macros, and there was like nothing. There was just a number, a picture, no description. Uh, so I mean, there's a lot of it's going to be a lot of work. Right, and I think some of that was uh, to become a national register district. You had to individually nominate the properties, but they're doing it for the district, and so they relied on the district nomination and not each individual form so much. And so that's uh, slightly different now. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think, you know, we could wait till next meeting and then come back and have, you know, some discussion about what we think is the right boundary to start with. Okay, let's move then to the next item on the agenda, which was a discussion of uh, par including parking lots uh, in project reviews. And this was something Steve had asked to discuss. Yeah, when I, um, I I called them asked, you know, when we were dealing with 90, was it 96 or 98 Bering Street, you know, um, it wasn't clear whether our uh, purview included parking lots. So I called uh, the Massachusetts Historical Commission and they said that it varies from town to town. And it turns out that we, the town had just used um, the boilerplate um, language that the Massachusetts Historical Commission had. 
So the question is, should we try to exempt explicitly um, parking lots, um, unexempt, I mean, uh, parking lots from, from, you know what I'm saying. Right now, parking lots are exempt. We want to unexempt them so we have purview over them. And then when I had a brief conversation with Nate, he said that he would talk to Rob Mora, and he wasn't sure whether that was really necessary. So that's that's just what I wanted to I wanted to see if Nate could elaborate on that and and discuss it. Yeah, I mean, Steve's right. It's interesting the uh, the bylaw or the state statute and then their guidelines, you know, lists like twelve exemptions and one is parking lots, but it's not necessary. I mean. The way the state statute is written, you can include them under your review, but the state tells communities, you know, in their template to just exclude them. Um, so it's, it's funny uh, that, you know, you have to kind of read the really fine print to determine that you could include that. And so, you know, what, I, what I've said before is that the commission can regulate parking in so much as the placement of buildings can shape a part, you know, if someone wants to put a parking lot in a location that then the, the location of the building and the massing of the building isn't appropriate, then really the commission's uh, discussion is, well, move the building forward. And then it's really the, you know, the parking has to become secondary to say the building, as opposed to, you know, the developer having the building where or the parking wherever they want it. And then, you know, but if parking was uh, not, you know, was not exempt, then the commission could you know, it's two things. One is uh, could feel more comfortable, you know, saying we want the building here, or it could just say that it doesn't want parking in front of a building because when cars are parked there, it obscures the view. And so it does give the commission a little bit more ability to, you know, look at a site plan and move parking. Uh, you know, I guess the only, yeah, you know, my thing would be, you know, is there does that mean anytime someone changes a park a parking lot or a driveway, does it need to go to a public hearing? So, uh, you know, that's typically the way it would work, right? If they're adding cars or moving parking. And so sometimes we've done uh, in our rules and regs, some further exclusions, right? That we found were, uh, for instance, like putting in plumbing vent stacks where there's already some located or right, an HVAC equipment if it's already where that equipment is located on a property. Um, so it could be that we include parking under review and maybe there's, um, you know, some standards of criteria we could put in so that things don't have to always come to a hearing, right? Like if parking is behind the building, then it doesn't need to, or, you know, or whatever it is, right? That, that way, if someone, you know, we can kind of get at what we want, want it to be, um, what kind of standards we're using. If I recall from the conversation of the other presentation of the property, it was also about how large and how much, <laughs> like the you know that. So obviously, if they're putting in multi um, units, they need a certain amount of parking. But then, from our perspective, you know, it was twice as much parking as building or some you know kind of green space and green space is also exempt. So it was like we were getting caught in well, we can't comment on the green space, we can't comment on the parking space. We were only limited to the buildings, and they were kind of putting in how much they needed of each as exemptions. I mean, maybe I was misinterpreting kind of what was going on, but it kind of felt like um, it was easy to kind of say, you can't comment on how much parking space there is or anything like that. Like I know they need a certain amount whenever there's multifamilies, like you have to have a certain um, amount of space for residents and units and things like that. But I think it was, I guess, not just the location of where that parking is, but how much. Uh, Bruce. Yes, I was uh, would say something very similar uh, when uh, uh, when I said I think my uh, stated uh, uh, basis for moving that this was not appropriate or that that project was was not appropriate was uh, all to do with scale uh, i think that we the uh, the the guidelines or the bylaw i'm not sure exactly where in the structure but it's uh, um 
it, it talks about uh, fitness in terms of scale and other things. And it seemed to me that that uh, the parking more than even the buildings uh, were um, violated a, a sense of appropriateness of scale. And that was the way I was thinking of the parking through the uh, the wording of the bylaw. I, is, is, was that... Uh, is that uh, legitimate, uh, do you think, Nate? I think now it isn't, um, but if it were under review, it would be, right? So the way I would look at it now is parking's exempt, but if a building is located or designed in a way um, because of parking and the commission finds that the building's location on a property or it's massing or something isn't appropriate, I would, you know, the commission can say, move the building forward. And then it's really the developer or applicant's response to move the parking right to adjust for what the commission wants in terms of the building. Um, yeah, but I would say that that's, that's not, I mean, given the example that we were shown, it demonstrates to me that parking should be a, a, an element of consideration. Yeah, and I think, right. And so it could be that, um, it could be that in other local historic districts, or other communities, you know, they the way they regulate parking, whether it's through zoning or other regulations, is different than the way Amherst does, or they just don't have the demand, kind of the say the student rental demand where there needs to be that much parking. And so Amherst, in Amherst case, parking, you know, is justifiably regulated, could be regulated by a local historic district. So I yeah. you know I'm okay with that. I think we just would have to um, you know then amend the bylaw. And the way the bylaw works is every local historic district is under the same bylaw. Sometimes a community might have uh, an appendix that regulates each district differently, say with design standards or something. But if we, you know, if we don't do that. So it could be that we would say parking is now regulated and we change some language and then it applies to all districts, you know, if that were enacted. I would love to do that. I agree. I Given what we've been shown, it seems like we, uh, we've been once warned. So do, do we have a motion to amend the our bylaws to? Uh... Well, the first thing before we go there, Nate, you, can you do that? Can you draw up the amendment? Because I don't think any of us are, or, or even, or point us out where in the bylaw we should try to do it. And Yeah, I think I can work with staff. Yeah, I mean, I, I could do that. I could come up okay. with a, yeah. um, a proposed amendment. Okay, I'd love to have the honor of proposing an amendment which would unexempt uh, parking um, from the purview of the LHDC. And I think given that, uh, and I think the basis for this, if there's a necessary preamble, Nate, that uh, that makes the argument as to why, uh, you know, kind of a defensible statement, it would be that the, uh, that with the zoning board's uh, um, recent um, determinations of multiple primary or compatible primary uses, it has uh, enlarged the development potential of many of the sites in the district beyond that which was anticipated when the uh, bylaw was enacted. Because many of these properties are very big, and but we thought, um, I mean, I, 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 for years as an architect and so forth, it never occurred to me that you could load up these sites in the way that uh, we've now recently been advised that that we might. So I think knowing that that piece of new information changes how we should changes everything, and it certainly changes. I believe that we should be considering parking. Lots as an element of uh, of appropriate of, of, uh, as an element in consideration of appropriateness. So, Nate, I think we're hearing uh, everybody is in favor of you researching uh, the language for an amendment to the bylaw. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, so. Uh, we also are supposed to have a discussion of uh, chair, vice chair, and clerk. Um, 
should we be waiting to do that until we know the status of Bruce and Steve? You know. Yeah, I mean, it's not imminent. I was just thinking, you know, I mean, I think Nancy, you were voted not too long ago, but typically we'd ask boards and committees, you know, once a year uh, to, you know, to um, to do this. And I mean, it, it could be that the commission is comfortable and we don't need to. I just wanted to put it on the agenda. So I've been asking every board and committee just to have that discussion in the next few months. And, you know, you can just reaffirm the current status or, you know, so that's all. It's just a matter of typically the, Town manager's office or the town clerk, turn, town clerk's office will ask if boards and committees have done that on an annual basis. So, any thoughts from the committee? I, I'm comfortable waiting. I think we have a chair, and that's the key. Uh, and, and we have a vice chair. Steve is serving as our vice chair, but we oh. don't have a clerk. What What is the role of the clerk? Yeah, I mean, typically the clerk would say be uh, could be taking minutes could be helping with, um, you know, administration of the, of the, um, of the, you know, public body, we have staff for that. And then they're, you know, they're kind of like third in line to chair a meeting if the chair and vice chair are, are not present. However, I feel like if you get down to the level of the clerk, you'd probably also have uh, issues with quorum. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it, I don't know. I think it's kind of like an outdated, uh, you know, position or that some boards and committees have. Okay. All right, then it sounds to me like we have run through the various things on our agenda and we could move to adjournment unless there are other things that people would like to discuss. Is there any new business or old business that I hasn't guess been resolved? We have to figure out what our next meeting would be. Right. Yeah. Have we not typically waited for Nate to advise on the uh, inflow of applications? Okay. Yeah, I mean, interesting. You mentioned Fearing Street. You know, they've contacted the town to have a meeting again. So I think they'd like to uh, either submit an application soon or, you know, have another meeting. There are a few projects that are still, you know, it's funny, um, you know, there's probably a half a dozen applications that could go to a hearing. But usually what happens is, for instance, they're, 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 they're kind of minor for installation of, um, say, a mini split system. And when we tell the contractor that if you locate the you know, outdoor equipment that's either out of view or next to, say, like the um, uh, one of their electrical box near where the existing utility box is, then it's excluded from review, then sometimes they change their plans to do that. And so recently we've got a, you know, there's been a number of applications received for you know, a few for mini splits for solar on a few things and we're still working with the contractors and oftentimes it ends up being that they don't need to go to review because they move things around or you know they they can make small modifications but um so i, I think we could try to schedule one for like mid uh mid july or whenever we think is good you know it could be that there's an application or two received and then that meeting if we give ourselves enough time it could become a public hearing as well you know, if say, for instance, something is submitted this week or next week, we could post, we could uh, post a legal ad and still have that meeting be also a public hearing for a project. Okay. Um, um, and then she was going to ask Nate, uh, in that example you gave, Nate, where contractors are moving uh, their, or applicants are moving their equipment around to places where it um, dodges the bullet, so to speak. Um, what happens if they then still run their line sets, you know, which are the refrigerant lines, which they then cover in these white, uh, uh, basically uh, PVC uh, insulated coatings? Um, does the commissioner, if, if they run that kind of thing across the face of the, 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 the front of the house, I assume that would trigger um, an appearance here. Would that be true or not? Yeah, I think in our bylaw, we say that, you know, um, the, the condenser unit has to be, you know, no more than like five feet off the ground. You know, the top of it can be, has to be less than five feet um, screen from view. And then there can be no more than 15 linear feet of, of line visible. And so uh, typically when we talk to a contractor, that's what we communicate. So okay. you know, a, recent, a recent one, it looked like they're, it looked like possibly they're gonna run up the side of a building, you know, um, 
two stories. They're just going to run the lines up. And I said, well, if you can keep the lines inside or run them in the basement and go up the back of that, you know, go somewhere where they're not visible, then, you know, the project is excluded from review because the unit itself wasn't visible. And so, you know, in the end, they just, they say, we'll run the lines. Um, you know, they amend their say electrical permit or whatever permit and say, they'll run the lines in the back of the house. And so then it just isn't right. You know, we kind of. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for interceding on our behalf. <laughs> we yeah, well, we, have a new, we have a new permitting software. So, I mean, I think today I just got four new notifications of projects that need review. And so, you know, it was things like, like this we're talking about, you know, someone wants to put in a fence. And then I say, well, here's, you know, one was a mini split, one was solar, and one is some electrical work that may affect the exterior. So, you know, it's, um, we do look at almost every application that comes in building or electrical or plumbing. Um, and usually we try to get ahead of it. Right? I mean, to me, the better option is to have them do it so it's not visible or it doesn't need a hearing. <laughs> uh, so we should then set up a meeting for July uh, and um, I guess it could be the third or the fourth week of July. Are, are people around then? I think I am. Where, uh, Karen is not. Um, I think, yeah. I don't know whether Greta <clears throat> is. Steve, yeah. are you around? Yeah, I'm around. Nicole? If I just say, if I say Monday, July 17th, does that work for, for most of us? Works for me. Uh, it depends on when my son leaves, but it's it probably is fine for me. The Tuesday, the 18th, uh, Nicole, are Mondays bad for you? No, Mondays are good. Um, it, it was a pottery class that my daughter won't be taking over the summer. So. <laughs> okay. I mean, I suggested that because if, for instance, we need to have a hearing, we need a two-week notice, we need to like almost like a three-week lead time. And that way, if if that's the case, it gives us, you know, a week and a half to receive applications. So then that, that you know, the 17th or 18th of that week could also serve as a hearing. Mm. Monday to Friday is a better for me because I'm become very active in Habitat. Uh, I've been active in Habitat for years, but but now I'm a build team uh, project leader for a project in Northampton, and and uh, that will put me likely uh, uh, active on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So Monday is always going to be a better day for me. All right. So let's set up a Monday the seventeenth. Then is that? Mm -hmm. Three o'clock. Yeah. Done. Okay. Um, any other business? Uh, do we have a move to adjourn? So moved. I will. I will second by clicking the red button. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.